Father God, those are simple words. And yet they are so profound. There is power in that phrase. God, you are so good. Father, we don't always give you credit, though you certainly deserve it. How good and faithful and right and true you are to us. We so easily get distracted. We so easily focus on other things. Try to work out our problems and our circumstances on our own. All the while, there you stand. Patiently waiting for us to acknowledge that yes, in fact, you are good. That your ways are better than our ways. That your plans and solutions are better than the best of the plans and solutions that we can come up with on our own. And so, Father, today we are reminded of this great truth. That you are good. That your love endures forever. That you are faithful. That you are kind. That you are just. That you are forgiving. Lord Jesus, we honor you. We celebrate your good work. Lord, just a week ago, we gathered together and we declared victory with you as we celebrated your resurrection from the dead. The very symbol and signal that defeated sin, that defeated the death, the, the seemingly most final thing that this world has to bring into our existence. And yet you proved that even in death, the game is not over. The journey is not finished. In fact, there is much more to come when we acknowledge and embrace just how good you are. Father, today we praise you for those who are gathered together here, who are seeking your face, who are seeking to understand your wisdom for their life. Lord, I pray for whatever has brought us together in this place today. Lord, would you speak to each and every one of our hearts right where we are. Speak clearly and profoundly, Lord God, that as we leave from this place this day, we know that we are a part of a great church, that we are a part of a family that loves and supports and will continue to invest in one another. But most importantly, when we walk from this place today, might we be a bit more encouraged, might we be a bit more uh, ready to respond to the needs, to the circumstances, to the opportunities, Lord God, that you present to us as we walk from this place. Lord, it is our desire that we are a people that reflect your holiness, that reflect your righteousness, that in everything that we say and do, we lift you up so that others will come to know you, Lord Jesus. Father, today there are many who are struggling in many different ways, from physical ailments, from common cold to allergies to, to chronic disease and suffering. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would be the great physician and provide the healing work that is needed. Work through the medical doctors and staff and bring wisdom to these circumstances that desperately need a touch from you, Lord God, today. Lord, for those who are struggling in finances or in relationships, Lord God, we pray that you would speak to the needs and the circumstances of your people. That, Lord, we know that you are leading us and guiding us so that as we follow you, we can confidently approach everything that comes our way. We trust your wisdom. We trust your direction. But most importantly today, heavy on our hearts are those who don't know you. Those who have yet to acknowledge that you are good. To understand what you did for them in an extravagant demonstration of your love on the cross of Calvary. Lord God, today we pray that you would speak to the hearts of those who you are seeking and calling to yourself. We pray, God, that you would prepare us as followers, as disciples of you to be ready to respond to the opportunities to help make you known. To connect the dots so that more will come to celebrate in this good work and in your name, Lord Jesus. God, we are your people. We love and we honor you. We praise you this day. And all God's people say. Greetings, Salem's Grove, Nazarenes. Carrie Willis here, District Superintendent of the Philadelphia District Church of the Nazarene. I want to take a moment to personally invite you to this year's District Assembly, the Gathering. Yes, some assembly required. 
This year we changed the days and dates of district assembly in hopes to be able to welcome younger Nazarenes and that our bivocational pastors can participate. Join us as we celebrate the goodness of our God and what He has been doing in us and among us. We are excited to recognize His presence through song, prayer, missions, reflection, ordination, and even communion this year. It is my prayer that during our assembly weekend, we can in community praise Jesus for our past, thank Him for partnering with us in our present, and He will surely focus us forward to His future. The future is preferred. I hope to see you in May. Remember, presence matters most, and you are loved. If you haven't gotten a chance to meet our district superintendent, our district pastor yet, you'll have you know that you need to know that he is just a larger than life personality, and he just loves people and he loves being with people and praying for people. And uh, we are really excited and blessed to have him as our district pastor, and uh, excited as we gather together this coming weekend uh, for our annual district assembly. That's where the district churches, all of our churches across the Philadelphia district. Uh, gather together and we kind of do some business for the church but as you've heard him share it's going to be a lot of celebration and worship uh, this weekend and uh, really just looking forward to what God has in store for our district as God is revamping and shaping some uh, direction and vision for our district as a whole um, and uh, looking forward to what God has uh, to, to be doing within us understand church we are a part of a much bigger church certainly denominationally and even beyond and uh, it is our job to work together to make sure that the kingdom of God continues to grow and expand. Looking forward to being a part of that. I'm certainly, as part of my district responsibilities, involved in some of the leading and some of the events uh, that will be taking place uh, over this coming weekend. In the worship folder, you see kind of a, an itinerary in there uh, held at our Lansdale and Fairview churches uh, this coming weekend. Uh, if you're available at all, would like to come out kind of even be for a part of one of those services. We certainly invite you to come and be a part of that um, for any of those parts that, that uh, you would see fit. Uh, Friday afternoon, uh, I'm going to highlight that just because I can and I'm in charge of that one. But uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the NFL chaplain from the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, I know in this neck of the woods that may not be that exciting, but it is really exciting because I know him. Uh, Lamoris Crawford is amazing, uh, amazing communicator. He graduated from Olivet Nazarene University. Um, and just really dynamic in the way that he presents the gospel and presents um, kind of the instruction of uh, community that we've asked him to teach on uh, this weekend. So I invite you to come. If, if nothing else, at least pray for your district leaders and those who will be representing our church and those who will be a part of that uh, gathering this, this coming weekend. Lots of things going on in the life of the church, so I encourage you to look at your bulletin. Uh, Kind of getting to the deadline here, ladies, to sign up for the ladies' spring dinner. Uh, there are sign-ups at both connection centers. Before you leave today, make sure that you sign up uh, and make sure that we have your information so that we can get you whatever you need. If you have any questions, you can see Ashley Martin. If you're not really sure who she is, you can, there she is right there, waving her hand. There you go. That's Ashley Martin. Make sure you make your checks payable to church with the memo line for the ladies' banquet, and then I'll get the money from the church. Okay. So if there are questions about you know, how to pay for all of that, um, basically just write it out to the church and make a note on it for, for, uh, for that dinner. We'll get it where it needs to go uh, that way. Lots of other things in the worship folder. We certainly want you to pay attention to that. But one other thing I do want to draw your attention to, if you weren't here last week for Easter Sunday, uh, we made a big announcement. Uh, in your worship folder, you have this insert in there uh, for Right Now Media. It's a new resource that we are gifting to our church family. Um, and inviting you to take a look at it and research that. Uh, if we have your email, we have sent you an email with this link where you can sign up. If you don't, if we, if you didn't get an email, that means we don't have your email, and we should probably get it. Uh, or uh, there's something wrong, we had the wrong number put in or something like that, and we need to make sure we correct that. So if you didn't get an email, communicate with the church office, and we'll make sure we get that corrected. But in the meantime, uh, you have ways to access our account even without that email. Certainly by texting us at the information on this or using the QR box on this uh, sheet that will get you to our page as well where you can create an account and set yourself up uh, so you can watch these uh, devotional Bible study resources on your smart TV, on your phone, on your computer, any of those aspects where you watch media, uh, you'll be able to do that. And this is a free resource to you um, that has a host of uh, topics, uh, Bible study videos, 
here at Bible study for you. There's on the back, you'll see kind of a promo for the kids' side. Lots of great Christian children's videos and movies uh, and shows for them to watch and to uh, uh, kind of enjoy for, for their benefit. Um, we just want right now for you to just be blessed by this resource. We're going to be training and teaching how to use this more in the coming weeks. Uh, but, but for now, we just want you to get on, explore it, see what it's all about. If you've already done that, we encourage you to use this and invite, share it with somebody else. Just because they don't attend our church on a regular basis doesn't mean they can't in, enjoy this gift and resource. Um, our price that we pay as a church for this for you will not go up. They've promised us that. This is a gift that they encourage us to continue to spread. So a great resource when you are working with a friend you know, who maybe is struggling in an area or has questions about something, you do a little bit of research, find out some Bible studies that you like or think would be helpful, and you can simply encourage them to sign up with this, um, and uh, they'll be able to get some of those additional training and resources. And so it's just a really amazing tool, and uh, looking forward to kind of uh, implementing this more in what we do here at the church. And, in the months to come. So uh, at this time, uh, we're going to invite our ushers to come forward and uh, we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Father God, we love you so very much and are grateful for the opportunity to serve you and worship you. We do that now through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And we pray, Jesus, that uh, as we do that, you would bless those who are giving, that you would lead us as leadership to know how to use it wisely, and that ultimately your kingdom will continue to grow as a result of your recovery. Lord Jesus, we love you. Kim. Go away. Kim, I'm sorry. Then come to church with me, Dave. It's Easter morning. Kim, we go through this every year. That's right, Dave. And every year you use the same old excuse for not going to church. I think by now you would understand what I went through. Dave, I know what you went through. And Desert Storm was horrible. No, Kim. You don't know. You weren't there. Every time I look at my hands, I know God wasn't there either. I bought these for you. Happy Easter. Dave, I don't want flowers for Easter. I want you to come to church with me. Besides, roses aren't Easter flowers. Who gives roses at Easter? I thought they were pretty. Kim, please, just, just come home. I'm walking to church. It's not safe out here in the park. There, there's no telling who's lurking in the shadows. Happy Easter! Happy Easter! He is risen! He is risen indeed! Look, Penelope, we have visitors on Easter morning! And what a very lovely couple! Hello, my name is Cecil, and this is Penelope. And we live here in this big, beautiful park. Oh, well, I'm Dave, and this is my wife, Kim. Hello. Let us guess. You are having your very own personal and special sunrise service upon this Easter morning. <laughs> uh, no, we're not. Oh, no, you're not waiting on Easter money, are you? <laughs> because if you're, he's back here at the mall. <laughs> Little boys and girls were getting their pictures taken with them. Yeah, he was getting all grouchy, and his head was all crooked, and, oh, I mean, he was wearing tennis shoes, and that's how we... There's no such thing as the Easter Bunny. Oh, good. We didn't want to ruin your Easter. <laughs> it's already ruined. My husband won't go to church with me. I'm sorry, but I don't believe in Jesus. <gasps> oh, why not? How do I know this whole Easter thing really happened? I mean, I wasn't there. Then he tries to make up not going to church to me by giving me these roses. Everyone knows you don't give roses at Easter. Oh, no, Miss Kim. Roses are Easter flowers. What? Yeah, remember? 
Up from the grave he up. Uh, Rose! Home! <laughs> See him? Mr. Dave, maybe you don't believe in Easter because you never heard about the rose. Can we tell you a story? Sure.
gathered together and we celebrated Easter. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' significant moment when he defeats death and the grave and sin. The moment when God, when Jesus is able to redeem a relationship between a holy God and his sinful people. We celebrate this good news story over and over and over again. Jesus had a mission. He had a job to do. When he came and he lived among us, he knew from the very beginning that he would be a sacrifice. He would be the, 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 the peace that God would use in order to redeem his creation. His mission, when he died, and he rose again, was complete. At least for him. But as we continue to unpack this story, we see that Jesus rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, and for the next 40 days. Jesus made it possible for people to have face-to-face -face encounters with the resurrected Jesus. Because he wanted people to realize that yes, in fact, he had risen. Yes, in fact, the grave no longer held him. He was, in fact, alive. And though his work in, on this earth was now complete, the mission wasn't done. And over those days where Jesus gave face-to-face -face encounters with everybody that was willing to take it, he shared with those people that the work was not done. That the mission had more to accomplish when Jesus was ascending into heaven, he was giving his church, his people, a very specific mission and job to do. From that time, the church has taken on very different shapes and forms throughout those generations. But the purpose of the church has never changed. That purpose was clearly established by Jesus himself in his own words in two key scriptures that I'm sure many of us are very familiar with here today. But I want us to hear those scripture verses again from the words of Jesus as if we hear them for the first time, as he is giving us his mission, maybe for the first time, maybe all of I want to invite you to stand with me this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 40, and Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. We know this is the great commandment and the great commission. Hear these words, this mission of Jesus. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two 
commandments. Flip over to chapter 28, verse 19. Before Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives these words. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you always. Do you hear that? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we thank you for your word, your life, your mission and purpose. We thank you that you were clear in giving us the work to be done. Father, today as we kind of unpack this mission as it pertains to us as a church, we pray that you would not just let it be words that we kind of affirm, but words that begin to shape the way that we think, the way that we behave, the way that we act with, react and react with one another as well as with all those we come in contact out and about. Father, shape us, prepare us, help us to lead and be a part of this mission that you've called us to. We love you today. We pray. Amen. Maybe see you. So, since Jesus establishes his church nearly 2,000 years ago, we, that being God's people, have worked hard to be the best possible church that God has called us to be. The church has branched into many different denominations and tribes, each grouping of, and each grouping of the church has banded together based on common interest and application of God's word. But it is God's purpose that is in us living out this message of love and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. It is this purpose and this message that Christ has given us that bands us all together. Many local churches have identified unique and creative ways to articulate and live out this purpose that God has given to us. And we here at Seelands Grove Church of the Nazarene are no different. I want to take a moment before we branch forward in unpacking some of this purpose and mission that we believe God has given to us. I want to take a moment and just kind of backtrack a little bit and kind of catch us all up to speed on where we've come from as a church. Understand, we as a church are about 69 years old as a local community church. We began back in 1950 with some 10 revival meetings that were taking place in this very community. As a result of those 10 revivals that were taking place, people were coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. People were surrendering control and lordship of their lives to Jesus Christ. And coming together, this group of people realized that this was great. It was something to celebrate that people were coming to know Jesus. But we needed a tool, a mechanism, so that we can help disciple and train and equip and continue this great work that has started in these tent revivals so that they will carry on for years to come. And so a group of people gathered together to establish what we know now as our church in July 1950. And in the process of developing and organizing this church and starting to meet together and live together and share together and present who Jesus is to one another and to everyone else that they would come in contact with, they found themselves building their first, our first building over on High and Vine Street over a couple blocks away in 1956. By 1975, the growth that was taking place within our church demanded relocation. Now, I don't say that to kind of pat ourselves on the back, but simply to say that something was taking place from 1950 to this time period in 1975. What was taking place was that the story of Jesus Christ was being chosen, and it was being embraced, and the church was growing. And people were connecting with the, the hope and the reality that Jesus Christ is the answer to the questions, to the problems and the circumstances that they were facing. And it was growing so much so that we realized that in the location that our church was built, we would only be able to 
grow so far. And so the church leadership at the time realized that if we are going to have a greater impact, it was time that we find a new location to meet in. And so that church leadership at the time decided to begin to pray. And they eventually found the property which our church is now landed on. And they purchased that only to have three years later the opportunity to hold their first worship services here on this site in February 1978. I was about a month old at that time. <laughs> Forty years now our church has been serving and ministering here in this present location, continuing the work that began in those ten revival meetings so many years before. Some good ministry has taken place over those years. Fruitful ministry has taken place through those years. God's people have been encouraged and equipped. New people have found hope in Jesus Christ and have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and has surrendered their life and journey to Jesus as a result of the ministry that has taken place in our community here in Seelands Grove and the surrounding communities around us. Our earliest days in mission were molded by this desire to see Jesus become known and to invite Christ to shape our hearts and our lives to all those who we would minister to. That purpose has served as a foundation to everything that we have done in our existence as a church. That said, as any organization or church ages, it is important to evaluate and reevaluate our mission and purpose of the work that we are doing. So our church leadership recently had agreed to that this was a good time to review our purpose and make necessary adjustments if there need be to ensure a bright and fruitful, fruitful future for, for us. Lest we become a church filled with people who are content simply going through the motions of showing up at church on a Sunday morning only to wait until next week to come back and play the game all over again. After months of prayer and study, we do now believe that God has led us to a fresh take on our biblical purpose. And over the next several weeks, we will be unpacking this purpose together. This morning, I want to draw our attention to our updated mission statement. Now, mission statements may seem stuffy or something that is done in the corporate world, but I'll tell you this morning, they are important because they serve as grounding words and ideals that link an organization, and in this case, our church, through time and space. An agreed upon and accepted mission can serve as the foundation for which we can begin to dream and build all of our ministry on. That said, for any church to clearly embrace the mission, we must first understand the specific mission that God has given to us, and so we begin with that mission, as we read just a few minutes ago. The mission that comes directly from Jesus' own lips and from his own heart in his great commandment and his commission. A, a mission that tells us who we are, that we are those who are people who are loved by God and who love others with that love that we have received from God. A mission that informs us that we are what, of what we are called to do together, and that is simply that we are called to make disciples. A thorough study of this purpose and a detailed look of where we have been and what God has done through us as a church. And as we have begun to ask and pray for God to lead us where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do has now resulted in this updated and freshly oriented ministry and mission for our church. I want to draw your attention to that updated mission. You may have seen it in your worship folder or in the annual report that was published a couple weeks ago. Uh, but I want you to not only see it, but I want you to hear it as we now begin to learn how to articulate this and live this mission out as a body of Christ. As our church, our mission stands that we are serving Christ now as an authentic biblical community, being fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, who are committed to loving others. Church, I want you to say that with me this morning. Would you say it again with me? Serving Christ now as an authentic biblical community, becoming fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, who are committed to loving others. 
I will tell you, hours of study and prayer have gone into crafting these words. And all the vision team leaders say, amen. Right? Hours have gone into crafting and praying and seeking God's wisdom and how to articulate this for our local church. This morning, I want to briefly define this mission and what it means for us as a church family. And I want to begin by focusing on that first phrase, serving Christ now. Because we believe that this is the phrase by which we want to and God wants us to be known. Churches are known for many things, sometimes for good things, sometimes not so good. But these three words reflect our identity as the Seelands Grove Church of the Nazarene, but each distinctively paints a picture of who we are and what we do. For those of you who have been around our church over the last 10 years or more, you'll know that this phrase is not new. In fact, it is a piece of the former mission that we used and operated with, and it ties us to where we've been. And as we began to study it and talked about parts of our current mission and what God was doing, one thing became very, very clear in our conversations, in that this mission hasn't changed. But this mission needs to be clearly articulated and understood by our church family. And so as we began to craft this understanding around uh, many other thoughts and, and uh, discussions, what came out of this was a very clear picture. And I want to briefly try to touch on that this morning. Certainly will take some time over the next months and years to fully develop and flesh out. But this morning I touch on it and then I want to break this down in its three parts. First of all, we want to be known as a people who are serving. We want to be known as a church who serves selflessly. Who gives generously and is quick to meet the needs of those that God brings our way. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 6 of a great kind of passage of Scripture that, that really reflects this principle of serving when he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You, have, you must have the same attitude as that that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Serving is who we are. It's inherent to the way in which we live. <coughs> the phrase in verse 5, you must have the same attitude as that as Christ Jesus had. Look, what we're saying here is that serving is not necessarily the function, though that is the fruit of what we do. It is the attitude that is more important. In fact, one of the things that we discussed a lot about in our leadership conversations is that sometimes when we study the scripture, we get stuck in the story. We get stuck in looking to the scripture to give us the exact black and white answer of this is what Jesus has said for us and how we're supposed to respond. But the truth is when you really get to understanding the heart of the scripture, what we're looking at is the attitude of Christ. The reason why Jesus does what he does in his stories, why he communicates the way that he does. And so in serving it is the attitude that should be the same as Christ Jesus. Just like Jesus prioritized serving those around him, we too must do the same. Christ. Yes, we want to serve Christ Jesus. It is our desire to be his joy and his delight in living obedient and faithful lives as he leads us to do. Yes, we do this by attending church, by reading our Bibles, by participating in Bible studies and small groups. But our service to Jesus is so much more than this. Yes, we believe serving Jesus is worshiping Him, getting to know Him, inviting His wisdom and instruction to shape the way in which we live and the way in which we think. 
But we understand that serving Christ, serving Jesus, is indicative of how we interact with one another. And it probably is best described by Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 25. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When, did, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You were doing it. To me. Serving Christ is serving one another. It's identifying the needs and the circumstances and lifting them up above our own. Putting the interest of others above our own. Having the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus for those whom God brings into our life. Whether we agree or disagree with them. Whether we like them or we don't. Our attitude should be the same as Christ, Jesus. I love Jesus' words in Matthew 20, verse 27. And whoever wants to be first among you must first become your slave, your servant. This picture of Jesus who has wrapped a towel around his waist and picked up a basin of water and begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Jesus is the teacher. Jesus is the master. And he takes on the duty and task of those lower than him to demonstrate that he isn't better than them. His job is to serve them. Again, we get stuck in that imagery and sometimes we think about foot washing and we just get weirded out. Right? Because in our culture today, we just, we don't do feet. We cover our feet up. Right? We don't, they don't like that, and so we just kind of dismiss it, or we're like, that's like an old tradition thing, and we don't really know how to incorporate that into our devotional experience with the Lord. Again, I think this is one of those stories that though there is value in the practice of it, I think there's greater value in the attitude. The heart of what Jesus is describing and calling us to as we lower ourselves and elevate the needs and the interests and the concerns of those around us. Serving Christ now. Now, not later, not when I feel like it, not when I have time or when it is convenient. May, may we never dawdle or delay, but today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to respond to the leading and the prompting of the Spirit of God. We aren't waiting for another time or opportunity to get involved. Church, if you read Jesus' example, pick any gospel, pick any story. I really struggled with this this week as I was thinking through this sermon and putting this all together. Which story do I want to use? And I landed on Matthew chapter 14. Jesus has been serving and ministering all day long with a crowd of people. Bringing healing, bringing wisdom, bringing truth, bringing encouragement and hope to a crowd of people that was gathering around he and his disciples. And as this crowd is pressing in, they're continually wanting more from Jesus. What more can you give us? And then all of a sudden, the disciples, these wise men that they are, noticed a need developing, noticed a problem that was developing, and they said to one another, we need to figure something out. So they went to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, we're doing some good work today. Good ministry, healing, your love, your truth is being made known. But the day is getting late. It's soon going to be dark, and we have a crowd of 5,000 10, 12,000 if you count the women and children. That's a pretty big crowd. 12,000 people who have now gathered wanting the attention of one. And these people, they had no way to feed them. Jesus, send them to the villages. Send them out to go take care of this need that they have. Yes, I know you're meeting their spiritual needs, their physical healing needs. You're doing good work. But right now, the pressing critical need is their hunger. And we can't provide that with this little bit of fish and bread that we have. 
So send them away to get what they need, and then we can deal with this other need later. I love what Jesus' response is. Notice, that isn't necessary. You feed them. You feed them. In other words, what's happening right now in the spiritual desire that is in this crowd, the hunger that they have right now for my love, for what I am bringing to them is more important than anything right now. And so with my resources and my ability, yes, it may not seem like a whole lot, but let me tell you, we will take care of this need together. And I need you to do this now. Yes, we'll provide for the hunger, but we will provide for a whole lot more as well in this journey, in this process. Now is the time to act. The prompting was there. We don't put it on for a later date. The mission makes investing in the needs of those around us our priority. Serving Christ now. Now you're all smart people. I'm sure you can learn and memorize the entirety of the mission statement in all of its parts. I'm sure you can understand the heart of that mission. I'm sure you can understand everything that goes involved with that. You will own it, celebrate it, communicate it, share it, learn to live it out. My hope is that you will. You'll certainly get tired of me hearing it, say, talking about it. But I hope that that's a part of your journey and your experience. But to keep it as simple as possible, this is what I want you to remember. That we are a people who serve Christ. Can you remember three words? Can you put those three words to prayer? Can you put them in devotion? Can you share them and communicate those three words and articulate them in your own way? I hope so. I think you can. But real briefly this morning, let me finish and touch on the rest of this mission in its three parts, as it really serves to reinforce the power of these three words. First of all, we are creating a culture. A culture of being an authentic biblical community. A community that is built around the absolute truth of God's word. A culture that reflects the heart and the passion of the church. The one that Jesus shapes and defines that we see functioning in Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 through 47. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. An authentic biblical community is one who sees the need, cares for the need, prioritizes celebrating the person of Jesus Christ. And as a result, there is growth. The numbers are added daily to those who are being saved. As we share, we learn to live life together and love Jesus. The love of Jesus shapes the way that we think and the way that we behave with one another. 1 John 4, 19 through 21 says, We love each other because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God, but he hates his fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people that we can see, how can we love a God who we can't see? And He has given us this command. Those who love God must also love His fellow believers. <coughs> Church, first and foremost, if we are going to love God, we have to love one another. And that means even each other that we don't like. <coughs> that means even the, when we disagree. Even when we don't always see eye to eye. The love that we have for one another doesn't change. In fact, the love that we have for one another motivates us and propels us to fix the disconnect. To ensure that we are working together. We're creating an authentic biblical community. 
Second, that we are identifying who we are, that we are fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. I love that phrase. It's kind of catchy and easy to kind of roll off your tongue. But what I don't necessarily like at first glance of this is this word disciple. And not because I don't like the word, I love the word. I love everything that it means. In fact, I have taught often, in a lot of my teaching, I have moved away from calling people Christians and calling us disciples. In large part, because I think the word Christian has gotten watered down in our culture today. But the word discipleship brings with it a place of depth and meaning. But my concern with the word disciple is that it has been defined in so many different ways throughout the years. We need to be sure that we're saying the same thing. If I were to go around this room here this morning and ask you what your definition of a disciple was, there would be some similarities for sure. But I guarantee there would be a lot of varying differences on what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we as a leadership team have taken some time to unpack and identify what we collectively believe a disciple of Jesus Christ is here in our church. I'll warn you that this is a multi-week sermon series in and of itself. But I do want to give you the definition that we've come up with this morning as a way to begin to meditate and think on it today. We believe that a disciple is a believer who is submitted to the process of becoming more like Jesus Christ, displaying his character, daily living out his values and disciplines, and answering Christ's call to a life of service to others. That really is our definition of a disciple. The rest of the statement serves to support that phrase. By the power of the Holy Spirit, a disciple of Jesus accepts the responsibility to be trained and shaped by Jesus-like patterns of obedience and faithfulness in all of God's commands and discipline. These commands lead each other toward deepening spiritual growth as we seek the Father, follow Jesus, abide in the Holy Spirit, and give God lordship of our lives. Growing disciples intentionally walk alongside others, investing in them and modeling God's unintentional Unconditional love through constant care, instruction, and loving accountability. I told you it was a mouthful. You see, it's my hope and desire that as you read that statement and you think about your own discipled journey, that you certainly see where you are getting it. Where in fact you are living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. But I would also venture to guess, as you look at every element and aspect of this definition of a disciple, there are probably parts of your journey that needs to work. And that's where the church comes in. That's what the church has to offer as we work together to strengthen one another so that this becomes the picture of what we mean when we make disciples. We're fully committed to Jesus Christ. And finally this morning, our mission describes what we do. That we love others unconditionally. Notice this is the action verb and phrase. No matter what our differences or no matter what would keep us apart, the love of Jesus flows through us and shapes our hearts of compassion and grace for everyone. John 13, 34, and 35, now I'm giving you a new command. Before he's given us a command, now he's giving us a new one. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Love, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are, in fact, my disciples. Notice our love is not how we want to be loved or how others have loved us, but how Jesus has loved us. And as we learn to embrace that love and share that love with others, that is what people take notice of. That is what others are attracted to because the love of Jesus is pure, is right, and it draws us into the life that he has for us. It will, in fact, prove to the world that Jesus loves them when we learn to love as Jesus has loved us. Which leads us to 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Let us continue to love one another. Hear this, church. This is what I want you to understand. This love isn't just a one-time commitment. It's not a, hey, I'll love you today. Tomorrow's going to be a different story. This is a continual, ongoing, never-ending, never-ceasing commitment. Just like what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. It is over and over for you and for me. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. 
God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This church is real love. For every picture of love that our culture and our world tries to define and shape for us, the ultimate picture of love is what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary. And it is our desire that we demonstrate how much God has loved us. And if God has loved us this much, surely we ought to love each other the same. I pray and hope probably in some ways that God doesn't ever ask me to give my life for somebody. But would I, if that's what was asked of me? I don't know if you face that kind of question in our culture here in America. But there are believers around the world that actually face that question every single day. That question is real. Whether our life is being demanded of us or not, it's real. The question is, what do we do with this mission? Can you put that back up one more time? Serving Christ now, immediately, in this moment, with the prompting of what the Spirit has for you. As an authentic biblical community, what we, who we are becoming as we work together, becoming fully and completely devoted to that picture of discipleship that we've just kind of briefly looked at, Jesus Christ and being committed to one another by loving each other unconditionally and fully and completely. There's a lot of work in that mission. This is not something that just happens overnight or just because we decide that this is what we want to be our mission. It takes work from every single one of us. It takes more work than just showing up on a Sunday morning to church and it's calling it good. It takes work as we go from this place, as we go to work, as we go to school, as we interact with our family, especially those who we don't get along with very much. Right? This mission shapes us, the way we think, and the way that we behave, how we know each other and how others know us, and most importantly, how others know Christ. This is meant to serve as the foundation and the beginning of a lot more uh, detail in how God is shaping us my hope is that you'll take this and pray through these thoughts this week. But I also want to, as, you, as we close, our church leadership in this process, I ask them to be a part of unpacking our biblical purpose. And so we have written a devotional as church leaders. And we have published it, that we're giving it out today uh, to our church family. And within this devotional has a bunch of teaching and thought built on this whole biblical purpose that I'll be preaching on over the next several weeks. And we invite you to take this home and just spend some time devotionally reading. They're short one-page devotions, half-page devotions, that you can just use maybe in connection with another devotion you're already using. But we want you to be praying for your church over the next six weeks. Praying about your involvement and your investment in this church and where God is leading you and what God wants you to do, what He's calling you to be a part of. Celebrate with the stories. Invite God to lead, speak to you through the scriptures that are pointed out, the prayers that are prayed in this resource. Now we would all say we are not authors. This is not probably anything we would want published officially. But this is our heart as church leaders as we have tried to unpack the purpose that God has given us and we want to communicate that to our church family.